Hello, uh, I'm Trisha G. I'm Mike Barker. Both developers at LMAX, uh, a financial exchange here in London. And today we're going to give you a beginner's guide to hardcore concurrency. We developed uh, a message passing framework called the Disruptor, which uh, recently won the uh, Duke's Choice Award for Innovative Programming Framework. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about, about the Disruptor, but mostly we're going to dive in quite deep and narrow about what makes it so fast and, and how it works. Right, oh yes. And um, some of the things that we might be talking about might slightly contradict some of the things you've heard over the last couple of days. Um, for example, we might be arguing against a certain, a certain amount of abstractions, and yet we've heard a few people talk about how it would be nice to provide some abstractions to make uh, multi-threaded and concurrent programming a little bit easier. <laughs> we don't necessarily think that's true. Yeah, we, we, might, we might disagree with some, uh, a few of the, the techniques and tips for getting enhanced performance out of uh, software and hardware as we move forward. This is the audience participation bit. Is anyone here working on high performance code? Excellent, at least one person. <laughs> yeah. um, and who's working with um, concurrent code on a daily basis or regularly? Okay. Who finds it difficult? Excellent, it's always good. So why is it so difficult? <laughs> Compilers and CPUs are free to reorder code in order to uh, produce the fastest, most efficient way of working. So what you actually see in terms of um, what you wrote here in terms of the, the program order, you can't assume that's necessarily the order in which it's going to get executed. We all know this. We all know that uh, when one thread is, is, is modifying some of these values, you don't necessarily get the same values on another thread. Um, so the issue actually wrote the code. Just because z is equal to 40 does not necessarily mean from another thread modifying that code that w is equal to 10. Uh, and different CPUs can modify this at a different amount. So x86 don't tend to reorder things very much, but there are other CPUs which might reorder it some ridiculous amount. So the order is only guaranteed from inside the, the one thread which is actually executing that piece of code at, at any one time. So there's an ordering thing and a visibility thing. That's what makes uh, concurrent programming quite difficult. I was talking about reordering at the CPU level, so it's worth going into a little bit of the architecture of the CPU. And we've, we've heard this a couple of times in the last few days, how in order to get faster performance, we've gone multi-core in our CPUs. So we've got a number of different cores, a couple of sockets. We've got... Um, Inside the core, you've got the registers where you're working on various bits of data. You've got the store buffer, which is where information is waiting to be written to your different levels of cache. L1, which is L1 cache, small, fast. L2, slightly bigger, slightly further away, well, more, slightly slower to access. L3, shared across two cores. And eventually, main memory shared across both sockets. Obviously, as you go further out, your access time, it, it gets slower to access those different levels of memory. And that's the point about the caches, so that you can access things as quickly as possible and to reduce the amount of latency between your, your core and your main memory. Uh, some CPUs, you've also got um, invalidation queues, but we're not really going to talk about that necessarily here. And the Java memory model gives us a, a good model for, for reasoning about how things are going to interact in these, different, in these different levels. When your thread is working on a piece of data, that data could be anywhere in there. It could be in your register, it could be sat in a store buffer, hasn't been flushed to cache yet, it could be in main memory. Now, if, you're, if your thread is executing on here, and the data is sat somewhere here, and you've got another thread executing over here, it's not necessarily going to be able to see that data. So this is sort of taking a slight detour for a bit. Uh, one of the things I've noticed when talk, especially when I start listening to talks about performance, even from some you know fairly high up in the Java community type people, Josh Block is a good example. There seems to be a degree of not wanting to explain or help people understand the details. It sort of seems to be more about let's provide some really nice APIs, and if you just use it, it'll be fine. And I'm sort of coming from a slightly different approach. I think we actually need to know how these things work. We need to understand the details. And I've got a few examples going through a couple of different concurrent programs and looking at how they interact. 
and specifically from the performance side. And that's really what I care about, because I think you shouldn't really be doing concurrency and parallelism unless you're actually trying to get better performance. If you don't care about performance, why go parallel? Why make your code more complicated than it needs to be? So the first one, and the most interesting one, and probably, I think, the most important concept to understand when you talk about concurrency, especially from a performance perspective, is understanding contention. So I'm going to come up with a, it's a little bit contrived, but we'll have a look at it anyway. Very, very simple piece of code. Let's iterate half a billion times an increment of value in a single thread. This is not going to be run of multiple threads, so it's just a single thread incrementing the value. If we wanted to make that multi-threaded, here's an approach. We take out a lock each time. This is a horrible piece of code, and I hate it, but the number of times you see this turn up in examples when somebody tries to explain how concurrency works. Even some really, really good people, like the guys that are developing Google Go, they've got this exact example as the first example of concurrent code using Google Go. Really annoying, I hate it a lot, and you'll see why I hate it so much. And here's a third approach. It's also thread safe, but we're using a, an atomic long. And underneath the covers, there's a special CPU instruction. Java happens to use on x86, Hotspot happens to use uh, lock compare and exchange. There's reasons why that's actually not the best option, but this is um, a more efficient way of doing the same thing, but it's also thread safe. So let's see what these things do when we try and run them. So we're going to run these things half a billion times and see how long it takes to actually execute that piece of work. If we have just one thread, without any of the locks, without any of the atomic longs, just run it. It takes about 300 milliseconds. If we made that value volatile, so we just all we're doing is make it volatile, it's only one thread still, it goes up to, a, it's a 15x cost. And we'll go into the reasons why that is. I'll go into a bit more detail about that later on. Let's introduce the atomic. So we're using the atomic compare and increment. But we're still only running in one thread. And it's slightly longer than the volatile one. There's some similarities between the two. Both of them are effectively issuing a memory barrier, which has a very, very high cost to it. And in one thread, let's put in a lock. That's about 30 odd times slower than um, having no lock at all. But what you'll notice is it's roughly twice the cost of an atomic, or roughly the cost of an atomic plus a volatile. Depending on the implementation, funnily enough, a lock does one of these and then one of these. When it takes the lock out and when it releases the lock. When it's uncontended. So let's add some contention. Let's add a second thread. And let's start with a slightly faster version, which is the atomic. So two threads contending on the same atomic to try and increment this value. 100 times slower than not doing it multi-threaded at all. And also, notice, it's six times slower than doing it in one thread with an atomic. And this is starts, it starts to illustrate the cost of contention. It starts to illustrate, actually, when you're having two threads contend, contending on the same value, um, you basically got problems with trying to actually get that to be efficient, even with probably the most efficient way of incrementing it available in Java at the moment. Anybody want to hazard a guess when I do two threads with a lock, how long that's going to take? Any takers? Four minutes. It's 746 times slower. It's very slow. And this is one of, the, one of the very surprising things. If you're writing, trying to write a parallel algorithm, and you decide there's a mutable state, and it's shared, and you have to put a lock around it, because there's no other way to do it. You can't come up with a fancy, non-blocking way to do it. And that data is highly contended, like it's been written to a lot. There probably is no point in parallelizing your algorithm. And this is sort of where we, where we wanted to get to when we talk about we really need to understand the details. Often, it's better to actually not parallelize at all if you've got a contended problem. So this is probably one of the, one of the main things we'll, we'll, when we talk about the disruptor a bit later. One, don't share things, especially don't share right into the same thing. Parallel versus serial. This is kind of an interesting one. If anybody's ever seen this presentation by Guy Steele, he did a talk at Strange Loop last year about Fortress and about the implicit parallelism that comes inside a Fortress. And underneath, it uses fault join. So the idea being is that you can rewrite your algorithms using a divide and conquer model, a bit like Martin and, uh, and Ben explained earlier today. And you, decompose, you can decompose this particular algorithm, uh, parallelize the leaf node work, and then reconstruct the answer. And he talked about a, an algorithm for string splitting, the idea you basically partitioned this you know, the set of text, which had a number of words in it, and came up with partial results, and then recombined all those results together. Well, I thought it's quite, it quite interesting. And also, Scala's introduced parallel collections as well. So I did an implementation in Scala to say, this is so interesting. I think I can probably solve it that way. And then 
just as a tweak, I thought, well, I'm just going to write a brute force version in Java. Just the standard, iterate across the two of them. The code's actually up here on GitHub if anybody wants to have a look. Interesting difference is the serial Java version is half the number of lines of code of the Scala version, which is parallel. Serial one, parallel one. You'll notice that the, um, the serial one on a single thread is four times as fast as the parallel version. Anybody want to guess how many cores this is running on? This is running on a 16 core box. So even when I threw 16 cores at the parallel version, it could only get one quarter of the speed of the sequential version. And the reasons for this actually start to get very, very complicated. They boil down to the fact that because I'm running a single thread, I can do things mutably. I can be very, very memory efficient. I can take advantage of cache striding. Um, the parallel version, because of the requirements of fork join, I mean, end up doing a lot more memory allocation. I'm trying to push data through main memory and through the cores all the time. I'm doing a lot more allocation. Uh, a lot more allocation, garbage collections kicking in, all these other things. So it's sort of along the lines of parallelism can work and can work for a number of problems, but first understand your problem because you might find that all you're doing is making your code slower and more complicated. Here's another interesting one. I've been told a lot today that CPUs aren't getting faster. That's not the case. Clock speeds are not getting any higher, but CPUs are getting faster. So with that previous version of the algorithm that I wrote, the serial version, obviously, you know, yes, the parallel version is slower, but yeah, I could chuck more cores in and eventually become faster. But what would happen if I took my serial version and started running on newer and newer CPUs? If it is the case that CPUs aren't getting any faster, that code wouldn't get any faster. The results are slightly different. So this is four different CPUs. This very top one is from about 2008 to Core 2 Duo. It's my work laptop. I then have the second one down, that's an Ahalem EP, that's, a, that's the 16 core box that I did the previous tests on. I then have the Sandy, the Sandy Bridge Ultra Low Voltage, which is this Mac laptop, and then another Sandy Bridge machine I tried on it as well. And so those are much, much newer. And you'll notice it's almost twice as fast on the latest Sandy Bridge CPUs as compared to the uh, P8600, which is the dual core box. Interestingly, the Sandy Bridge uh, CPUs, which are both faster, have lower clock speeds. Clock speed isn't an indication of CPU performance at all. There's so many other things going on, especially in Sandy Bridge has a totally different um, cache and memory architecture to the old Core 2 Duo. A good example is a Core 2 Duo shares the same bus for both the memory traffic, that's the actual data, and the cache coherency traffic, that's the, all the extra little bits of traffic that tells all the caches that things were coming invalid as they change. And there's other things like wider data paths and more larger caches, more registers, all those sorts of things going on. So this assumption that CPUs aren't getting any quicker and that parallelism is the only answer, I'm not so sure. It comes down to your problem. So you know, focus on what you're trying to solve rather than just sort of saying, oh, I've got to go parallel. That's always, it's not always going to work. Back to the real world. <laughs> The, what, what was the problem that we were actually trying to solve when we came up with our, um, our message passing framework? As I mentioned, we're a financial exchange. So we sit quite firmly in the real world. And we have to be FSA authorized. We, um, in order to be, speed of execution is, is, is fundamental to our business. We have to be extremely fast because that's what's going to be our differentiator. We, have, we need to be able to match prices extremely quickly. In order to do that, we keep pretty much everything in memory. We, don't, we, we try not to do any I.O., we don't do anything which is, which is going to slow us down. We want to reduce latency. However, we are also FSA authorized and we can't lose any data and we've got to be reliable and highly available. Which means that we also need to do things like um, make sure we have the same data on a secondary and on, on DR. We need to journal the in memory state so that when the system goes down, we can bring it back up again without losing absolutely everything. Our initial architecture to solve this problem was a, a fairly common architecture, and it's a, it's a CEDAR architecture, stage event driven architecture, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and it, it's, it makes a lot of sense. You pull your messages off the network, uh, this is your receiver, you put them on a queue, you wait for the replication which is going to send off the data to your secondary server, you're going to get that to pull it off the queue, send it off to the secondary server, chuck your messages back on a queue. When journaling is ready, it's going to put it off the, take the message off the queue, 
journal your information to disk so that at this point you know that if it all comes, if it all comes crashing down, you can replay back off there. Put the next stage back onto a queue. Then you can do the stuff that we're all interested in, the actual business logic, the number crunching, the interesting stuff. Then you can chuck the results of that on another queue, put it to the publisher, and publishes it out to the network. This is just one service. We have a bunch of different services throughout the whole exchange which are doing slightly different things. But this is the fundamental architecture. We found when we started measuring, because measuring is very important when you have specific requirements like low latency, that this wasn't going quite as fast as we would like it to go. So we did some profiling to find out what was taking the time. Now, of course, replicating to some secondary server elsewhere and doing some I.O. to disk, yeah, that is going to take some time. Each one of these queues is taking um, 10 microseconds. Well, probably, maybe more. Um, and so you add up all of those and you find out that this is actually taking up quite a large amount of your overall latency. And your business logic, which is the interesting stuff and the stuff that differentiates you, is taking almost no time at all. This caused us some problems. We need the queues because we're passing, passing the information in between these different stages. But they're slowing us down. Why is this? Why queues suck? It's one thing we learned. We spent a lot of time actually optimizing queues. We wrote probably two or three of our own implementations of queues to try and get around some of the problems. And we basically came to the conclusion that the structure is fundamentally flawed as a way to move, move data between cores in the fastest way possible. And it comes back to what I was talking about previously with those locks. It's about contention. So here's a question. I've got a producer and a consumer on a queue. How many writers are there to the queue? Is there one? Or is there two? There's two. Both of the threads, in the, publish, the producer and the consumer, are both changing the state of the queue. They are both trying to move the pointers along. They're both taking out locks. They're setting things to null. They're both contending on the same piece of data. And as I showed with that lock example, that's where you run into your performance problems. That's where you run, in, run into um, these, these very interesting latency issues. As an aside, one of the reasons why a lock is so bad um, under contention and why it's so much worse when you have two threads contending is that the only way for the lock to arbitrate between those two threads and decide who has responsibility for that information is to ask the operating system. So you actually have to delve into a system call. Once you get in there, the operating system can do whatever it likes. It can basically stop your thread completely, move you off the core, reschedule another thread on your core, then it come in and stomp all over your cache and you know, basically mess it up. So by the time your thread gets back into running again, you're going to have a whole heap of cache misses because you have to draw data back into memory that was stomped over by the, by the previous process that happened to be running on there. And when you're running virtualized, it's even worse. So if you're on a virtual host and you have a contended lock, it has to go not just to the virtual operating system, but all the way down to the host OS to have that, have that lock resolved. And that's why you run into so many performance issues with them. So we find within an array backed queue, we've obviously got a head and a tail that need to be maintained. There's a size field that needs to be maintained. They're going to take out locks when they contend over this field here. And one of the things we found with queues, when you do some research and you look at um, any queuing theory, is queues are either in one of two states. They're basically either heading towards being overflowing or heading towards being empty. They will move in one direction or the other. You will generally never have a case where a queue will have a medium amount of data in there and stay steady. Um, you know, at 3 billion operations per second, a seat, you know, two independent threads, there's no way they can run at exactly the same pace, given they'll be doing different things. It's a bit like trying to balance, balance a pencil on its tip. It'll never happen. So you always will end up with a queue either filling up if the producer is faster, or draining if the consumer is faster. If it's filling up, you're basically screwed anyway, your system's about to fall over. But so most of the cases is your queues are draining. So you're going to be stuck in a situation where they're all contending at the very front of the queue on that one object that's being passed between them. And it's almost unavoidable. The same is true of list-backed ones as well. You'll be tending towards a single element. So if you ever look at something like the concurrent linked queue or the concurrent blocking queue, you end up in a situation you're trying to swap the same value in and out. Plus, if you've got a linked list type queue, you'll need to have a, a separate size variable being maintained, because otherwise you won't be able to have bounded semantics. So that would be contended as well. <coughs> 
What do we do to avoid this problem? How do we, how do we not use cues? Or what do we come up with as an alternative to cues? The important point here, obviously, was the contention. So we need to come up with something, we need to come up with contention-free design. This is a really sort of basic cut-down view of the disruptor, if you like. The main thing, really, is um, what we were, what you're finding with the with the cues is obviously the contending over one particular piece, piece or contending over the head and the tail and the size and all the rest of that stuff. Here, we use a ring buffer as the data structure. That's basically an array. And we keep the sequence number of the most recent thing that was written into the ring buffer. Uh, and this will, like ring buffers do, it will wrap round and round. And we'll just keep incrementing the sequence number. And we'll use it to figure out where in the ring buffer we are, at which point we've reached. The producer, therefore, will be writing into the ring buffer and updating the sequence number. So that's all, that's the, that, the producer is the only thing writing into this area. The consumer has its own sequence number. The consumer knows where it is up to, and the producer and the ring buffer know where they are up to. The consumer can read the sequence number, but it's not going to write to it because it's not writing anything to the ring buffer. If this is at, I don't know, eight, say, the consumer can say, right, I know I can read up to number eight, it might have its own pointer, and it's read up to five already. It's going to store five. It can see it can read eight. It's going to read six, seven, eight, then update its own pointer, its own, its own sequence number. It doesn't do any writing on the ring buffer at all. Applying this to the, the architecture we had before, which was this kind of linear pipelined process, we get something interesting out of this. We can actually parallelize. We can actually do things in parallel. So now our receiver is pulling stuff off the network. It's writing into the ring buffer instead of writing into a queue. It's updating the ring buffer pointer to 8. Replication, which is going to go and replicate your, th that data over to your secondary, it's going to read, see it can read anything up to number 8. It's currently at 6, arbitrary numbers. It's going to read anything from 6 up to 8. Journaling, similarly, it's got its own pointer. It's updating this. Now, we know the business logic needs to have those two things to have happened before it can carry on, because this is, this is, how, um, this is our reliability. We can't do anything until we've done both of these things. We can't carry on with any business logic. The business logic is going to know where the ring buffer is, but it can also read, but again, not write, where the other two points are. So the business logic is always going to have a number which is less than the others. It's going to read up to the minimum of these two numbers. So it's going to read up to six. It can read up to six from here. Again, nothing is writing to, nothing is trampling all over, all over everyone else's sequence numbers. When the business logic is finished, then it can publish it into another ring buffer. So then it is also a publisher for a second ring buffer. And then the, the, the network publisher can pull it off and chuck it off to the network again. How much faster is it? Um, we spent a lot of time prior to this bench, prior to developing the disruption, benchmarking various different queue implementations. And the fastest one we found was actually array blocking queue. So that was one of the one we compared it against. And these are two of the uh, performance tests that we ran. The unicast one is a single producer sending messages to a single consumer. And if you look at the array blocking queue, the array blocking queue maxed out at somewhere around 6 million messages per second. The disruptor maxes out somewhere in the region of about 25 million messages per second. With the diamond operation, that's very similar to what we were trying to do in our actual application. So this is either a message comes in, it then can do some bits in parallel, and then come back to a single queue where it's able to do the business logic at the very end. So in that sort of diamond configuration, the um, array blocking queue maxed out somewhere around about a million messages per second, whereas the disruptor maxed out at about 16 million messages per second. And these numbers are quite old, actually. We've got quite a bit faster than this as well with a number of other tricks that have been tried. But that's not the important bit. That's not the bit that we really cared about. What we were more interested in was the latency side of things. So I've got the array blocking queue. So these are in nanoseconds. So latency being, it's small, so the smaller number is better. The mean we found with the array blocking queue, about 32 microseconds. Disruptor, 52 nanoseconds. And this is probably a best case. This is probably two, CP, two threads running on the same socket, but on different cores. And you'll notice that this is very, very close 
to an L3 cache write. And that's sort of one of the, th one of the things we took into approaching this sort of design is actually thinking about what are our actual physical limits? You know, what is the lowest possible cost that we could see if we were to move a message between two cores on the same socket? And it's basically that. It's basically the cost of writing down to the L3 cache because a thread on the same socket doesn't need to wait till it gets all the way to main memory, for example. But even as we start to scale up to the two nines and the four nines, you start to see this, uh, the array blocking queue jitter right up to about two to four milliseconds. And this is, if you're trying to provide a system that's got not only low latency, but very, very predictable latency, this is getting terrible. I mean, we have a goal internally of an end-to-end -end transaction flow of one millisecond. So when a queue takes two milliseconds just to pass a message between two threads, and across the entire system, we we'll probably do about 10 or so thread transitions. It's starting to add up. So when we look at our two nines and four nines, they're starting to stay down into the hundreds and maybe the thousands of nanoseconds. So that's really, really important for us. So right, how does this all work? So where does the actual concurrency stuff come in here? So what I decided to do, this isn't actually the implementation of the ring buffer, but it's very, very similar. The principles are basically the same. And it comes down to this ordering and visibility stuff we talked about at the beginning being the sort of difficult bits, bits regarding this. So I've got two methods, one's to publish and one's to get. You actually notice there's a kind of a similarity between the, um, the queue implementation that Martin and Ben showed today. So this is sort of the, how you, this is how you would do a potential alternative. So what happens here? When we want to publish a value out to another thread, we have the value come in. We're holding a sort of a next value pointer in here, which is um, just a plain long. We increment it and say that's the index we're going to write to. We start at minus one, so the first index value would be zero. We then do a mod of that value, and we stick it into the array at that point. Then at the very end, we, at the end of this method, we set the sequence to be that value. So this is where we're saying this value is now available to be read. So we said, let's say we, we came in, it was the first message. Next value started at minus one, up, updated to zero. We wrote the entry into the array at zero, and then we said, okay, zero is now available to be read. On the other side, the reading thread comes in, and it has to pass in an index. It's required to have, have its own index and say, what am I interested in seeing? So let's say it passes in zero. It checks to see whether the index that it's passed in is less than or equal to the sequence that was supplied. If it is, it does a modulo into the, into the array, grabs the value out, and returns it. Otherwise, it just returns null. So there's a lot more going on in the real disruptor, but this is kind of a simplified version. So how does this work? Well, the only real concurrent structure here is volatile. That's the only thing, that's the only concurrency primitive that we've included in here. And what happens when we write to this volatile field, this is what's known, I'll probably get the actual term a bit wrong, but it contains basically it's an atomic ordered release. So basically what that means from a Java memory model perspective is any other write, so any other setting of a value must that occurs in our code before that point may not be reordered after it. So neither the compiler nor the CPU can take any of this, this, this logic and reorder it after the sequence value. If it could, then this would never work because it might be a case we updated the sequence before the data value was set and if we said, right, okay, it was, it, we would never actually see the value or you could end up with corrupted data, that sort of thing. For example, if these were switched round and you had and the sequence is updated before the data, and you came in here and you passed this condition, you'd end up fetching something out of here that wasn't actually there yet because this code hadn't got passed, hadn't actually come to this point. So a write to a volatile variable is an atomic ordered release, which means none of the writes that occur on the same piece of code can be placed after that point. So the other side of this is when you're reading from the sequence value. This is what's known as atomic ordered acquire. And what that means is no other reads that occur after that in the code order can be ordered ahead of it. So if we were allowed to reorder these two lines, for example, let's say the compiler changed our code underneath to store this referencing in a, in a, in a local variable before it executed this instruction. Maybe it was doing some speculative execution, decided, well, actually, I might have a branch, I might have a, cat, you know, a, a branch from this prediction here. So if I do this bit first, so I can get some more efficiency out of it. This read from a sequence you know, tells the CPU and the compiler not to do that. So we know if I've written the value zero here, 
because I've put the data into the array before I've written that value, I know that if I read that value, after that point, I can get the valid value out of the array. And that's all it does. And that's pretty much all of the concurrency constraints we have inside of inside the disruptor. And this is one of the, one of the principles around why well, you want to avoid a contention as well, is that when you go down to having only a single writer for a piece of data, that's not a case of creating locks so only one person can, but only where you only have one thing attempting to write to something, your concurrency code gets much, much simpler. It's so much easier to reason about and write this code when I know there will only ever be one thread writing. If I've got two threads trying to write to this, this code breaks. I've gone for the simple model of um, a single, single threaded publisher. It's actually, and the amount of extra overhead you have to uh, work in to make sure a multi-threaded publisher case would work is actually quite high. To the point where actually if you look at the disruptor, we provide um, a pluggable enum for the, two different, for the two different operations. So if you know you only have a single threaded writer, then you can actually just put in an enum saying, I'm only ever going to expect a single thread being written to this. And you actually get much better performance out of it. So to take a step down from that, how does the CPU actually ensure the right things are going on? This is where we get to step into a little bit of assembly code. So this is the code that's effectively generated from that publish method. At the very top, you've got a move and an add. So this is where we're, we're incrementing the, um, the next value to get us the new value up. This is where we're basically getting a reference to the array and we're storing the data in the array. Um, as people talked about previously, the x86 has quite a strong memory model. So with regards to reordering, the, the Intel CPU will not reorder stores with respect to other stores. So this addition of the next sequence and this storing of the data in the array and the storing of the sequence number, which is what each of those things are, will not happen out of order. x86 will not reorder those things. This final instruction here is the interesting one. This is basically the, the instruction that's used to publish the data out to all the other cores. So when we talked about that model of the CPU, where the data could be at anywhere in that sort of hierarchy of caches or in the store buffer, when you execute this instruction, it will actually flush the store buffer out, mark all of the, um, all of the other caches' references to that data as invalid, and we'll wait till that completes before returning. So you basically know that the data has been published and is visible to all other cores in the system. The interesting thing is that's really expensive compared to that. These are sort of single, you know, these are only normally a few cycles because it's just going to stick a value in a buffer. This can be 100, 130 CPU cycles. And when we talked about, when I showed the example of just writing to a volatile, even in a single thread taking 15 times longer, that's the culprit. That's the thing that's making the thing slow. Yeah? Have you tried on the Spark chip? No, I haven't tried on the Spark chip. Yeah. If anybody wants to, the code, I think the code for this is in GitHub as well. So um, if anybody's interested, let me know and I'll send the code and we can try it out. Be interested to see what the uh, assembly looks like as well. I think you'll end up with something very, very similar. If we get to the read side, there's no magic concurrency instructions in here. Um, on a Spark or a weaker memory model system, what you would actually have to do is if you were reading a value that was um, wrapped in a volatile, you'd actually have to go down what's done, known as flushing the invalidation queues. On some CPUs, when you execute that lock instruction or something very similar to it, it doesn't go and mark every single cache line as invalid. What it does is it marks its own ones as invalid and then queues up on all the other CPUs a, a, a message to tell them to invalidate their, their cache lines. So you'd have to do what's known as um, a read barrier. And that read barrier would flush the invalidation queue, marking all these things that held in the various layers of cache as invalid. So the next time it tried to read a value, it'd have to go all the way to main memory, or maybe L3, possibly. So, but with Intel, all you have to do on the Intel side on a volatile read is just make sure you're not reading it from a register. So um, it's basically here, get field sequences, reading it in. And again, uh, because Intel has this very strong memory model, as long as the instructions are issued in this order, it will not reorder reads with respect to other reads. So just having the instructions in the right order for Intel is sufficient to make sure that we haven't violated those ordering constraints. So we can't flip the order of those instructions when we, when we read from the uh, sequence value. So one other little trick that we ran into. Um, the really interesting bit is that lock instruction is not actually required. Um, it was a you know, little sort of stunning realization, fortunately not by me, by my 
boss actually who figured this out. But they actually have this funky little method in the atomic called lazy set. And when I talked previously, I mentioned that we have that ordering constraint inside the Intel CPU, both for reads and for writes. And that's all we have to actually ensure. We only have to ensure that when we write the data out, we're writing it out in the right order, and then we read it in, we read it in the right order. So that's all this lazy set does. It just ensures the ordering. It just ensures that those things that we've written prior to this point, so the index and setting the value in the data, it just makes sure this happens afterwards. And it skips the lock instruction. And that actually gave us probably a factor of two or three performance improvement over above the values that you saw previously. Yeah. Uh, it will do. I, the, the one thing to be a bit wary about this is it's not defined in the memory model. It's not defined in JSR 133. It is, though, said, because uh, Doug Lee wrote this, and he said, it does work. It follows the same uh, principles as an ordered release in the C++11 memory model. If you read the, um, I think there's a JSR 133 cookbook, which explains how to do all the various operations. This was added just afterwards after they'd finalized the memory model, and he needed it in order to get some of the stuff in fork join to work. So I think. So it does work sometimes. I believe um, a couple of JVM vendors are running into problems with this. I think there's actually a bug in the JVM on Mac with regards to lazy set. So um, you know, all of our tests work with this. We, we run quite a lot of, quite a lot of heavy uh, performance tests as well. This code is running in production in our um, in our exchange has been for about four months. So we haven't seen any issues with it yet. So it's, it's an interesting one. It's one of those ones that people haven't, you know, it's one of the ones I never really knew about until, um, until Martin found it. We did a number of other tricks to try and speed up the, the disruptor as well. One of the things that um, always puzzles people when they first look at the code is, um, is we have some weird extraneous things in the code. The reason being that when you're loading things into the different levels of cache, you're not loading individual items, you're not loading a variable, you're, you're loading a whole cache line, a whole, uh, probably about 64 um, bytes of, um, of memory that are all contiguous go into each of the, cache, into the caches. So when you're, um, you want to read uh, your head, um, you've got a thread writing to your head, you've got a thread writing to your tail. But they're actually sat on the same cache line. When thread one writes to this uh, variable here, then thread two tries to write to tails. These are two totally different variables. They're not actually the same thing at all. But it's going to have to go all the way up through main memory to get the cache line. And, that, and then when the first thread goes back to try and write to this, it's, it's been totally trashed because it's been moved over here. So you end up with this ping-ponging of the different cache lines. Even though the, the two vari they're two separate variables, you've got false sharing based on, on, the, on that cache line. So understanding this and understanding that this was a, a potential problem meant that we, came up with, we had to come up with a solution for it to give us um, our sequence numbers. Obviously, those are, those are key. We don't want false sharing with other people's sequence numbers. We just said that only one thing is writing to them at any time. So we, um, we make them independent by putting some, by doing a bit of a hack. No, it's not. It's a, it's a very efficient way to um, pad out the uh, sequence number so it's in its own cache line. We provide a bunch of padding variables, and we have to put them in a, a public method so that Hotspot doesn't optimize them away in a very useful way. Yeah, we've had assurances from a couple of people who work on VMs that if you've got a volatile variable and a public method, there is no known VM that will actually optimize away those, those, those values. Um, it's still not particularly well guaranteed. Um, Doug Lee actually um, talked about um, potentially adding an annotation to the code, which is an at contended. So if you have a field that you don't want to be false shared ever, you put an at contended on it, and underneath the hotspot VM can figure out what the cache line size is and just pad it out for you. And that would be a much better way to do this. This is nasty. <laughs> It's a trick. It <laughs> does work. Um, but yeah, this was, um, in terms of performance, not a massive performance gain outright, but it gave us much more predictable latency. It's one of those things we noticed that um, when we didn't have it, we would see spikes in our latency, as every now and again you'd get two threads trying to contend on the same cache line. Does it? In summary? So, I mean, the. One of the key things I wanted to always bring up is concurrency and parallelism are tools. They're not, 
be on end or you should be focusing on your problem and solving your problem and saying, well, if I need to make this faster, what is the best solution for that? Maybe it's a concurrent solution, like message passing solution, maybe it's going parallel, maybe it's not doing any of those, maybe it's coming up with something else. So it's a tool, it's not an end in itself. Ordering and visibility are probably your biggest key challenges, especially when you're getting to trying to write really, really high performance code and avoiding locks and doing some of the non-blocking type stuff. For if you care about performance, the details are very, very important. Don't believe everything you read. I think that was one of the first things we learned, just to come up with our own theories and test them and try a little bit of science, to be honest. Um, yeah, and some of the traditional ways of doing stuff is, is just a good way to make your code more complicated and possibly slower. That's it. Thank you. Questions? Okay. Questions? Um, I've noticed that, um, so with these two remarks, if you've got a lot of three yep. Does that have much effect on performance? Um, it, it does. I mean, we make them very, very large deliberately because we actually have, um, we have a, a reliable messaging system based off of them. So the idea being when we publish that message out, we publish it with that sequence number. So the receiver on the other end, if it's not incrementing, if it's not directly incrementing, it can knack back a value and just rewind the thread and replay those messages out. We deliberately make them big in that case. Um, to be honest, actually, no, you don't need them to be that big. If you're just using it as a barrier between threads, it needs to be of a size that's sufficient to deal with bursts in your system. So that's the whole point of having a, a queue. That's the whole reason you want a bit of a buffer, is a case that you get a burst of traffic that you've got a place to put it. You're not actually slowing down that producing thread. It can just stick it somewhere so the receiving thread can pull it off. One of the other things we do in the, in the disruptor, which you haven't really talked about, is uh, we have an efficient batching mechanism. So in the case where something like your journaler is getting behind, um, when we read the sequence value, let's say the journaler is stuck at number 10 at the moment. It's just finished writing number 10 off to disk. But in the meantime, it's taken about 10 microseconds to do that. It's got a fast SSD or um, SAS RAID array or something like that. 30 messages have arrived because you know, it's off a 100 gigabit, net, you know, 10 gigabit network and it's flooding through. By the time it comes back, it goes, oh, well, the sequence number is now 30. Well, I wrote 10. It can just iterate directly across from 10 to 30 and batch those into the same, in, potentially into the same block and write them to disk in a single operation. And it's, uh, we manifest that in the, form, in the API in the form of a callback. So the way you actually write to the disruptor, there's a thing called an event handler which you implement. And it gives you basically the message, the sequence number it was at, and a Boolean flag to tell you whether it was at the end of the batch. And so basically you just take the messages, keep adding them to the block until you've filled the block or you've got a Boolean saying you've reached the end of the, end of the batch. So that's one of the other things we do with, with buffering. I don't know any actor-based or event-based framework that does that. I think the disruptor is the only one that I've seen do that, but it's absolutely essential for, for low latency and high performance, especially when your individual message rates are higher than the throughput rates of a, of a, of a component, like a disk or like the network. You have to have some way of efficiently batching because, for example, a disk write, a 4K write will always be a 4K write. They always write in the same block. So if you're writing 4K with only 100 bytes in it every single time, why not write 4K with 4K in it? Same goes for MTUs on a network. Uh, you've been looking at bigger performance with different GCs before I get to JavaScript. Um, we haven't done. Um, all of our performance tests deliberately create no garbage. One of the other things that's in, in that we haven't really talked about is the one of the ways the disruptor works is that you can actually do it in a way where you don't actually have to allocate anything at all while it's running. So you, you provide, when you start it up, you can provide a factory that pre-allocates all the data. And this is what we do in our production system. Um, we basically say, we've got a, a message bus that gives us a byte array. And we take that data and we copy it into the pre-allocated byte array that's sitting inside the disruptor. So the way the API works is it hands you the object that you can sit in there and you can copy it in rather than allocating your object all the time. So well, most of our performance tests work like that so we avoid any jitter from the GC. So we haven't really bothered testing with the different GC things because you can actually build out systems that are completely garbage free. Um, not everybody wants to do that. I mean we're in a bit of a niche that we really try and attract down for this low latency stuff. Not a lot of people like that model, but when you're using things like some of the array blocking queues in the standard, JV, uh, standard JDK collections, you don't have a choice. You're forced to go down the slightly more garbagey route and allocate and maybe use immutable objects. The idea with the disruptor was to give you more choice. So you can go down the zero garbage reuse object route 
or you can have an entry which just is holding a value and you just use immutable objects like you might be more familiar with. So the GC doesn't actually play a huge difference um, with regards to Disruptor. I think we're good. All right. Thank, Thank you very you. much.